Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Amber Mack, and we're streaming live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Nokia.com slash CSP. Earlier today, we heard from Nokia's president and CEO, Pekka Lundmark. We also talked to a friendly hacker and the world's most connected person. In our last session, we heard from Brian Solis on how CSPs can unlock business potential. We also talked to Catherine Henry on XR experiences and Jefferson Wang on the future home in the 5G era. You'll be able to watch all these sessions on demand later today at nokia.com slash CSP. In our third and final Real Talk session today, we're gonna talk about how to build a better world that is sustainable and digitally inclusive. We'll also talk about what the future world will look like and the reasons 5G promises to be transformative for the economy as it brings human and machine closer together. To kick things off, we're talking about how the future of our physical world will be very different from the past and the present. Marcus Weldon is the Chief Technology Officer and President of Bell Labs, who's going to describe this shift and how the Network Plus plays a key role in new value creation. Hello, today I want to talk to you about solving the future value equation. That equation is going to have a couple of parts. One, I'm going to talk about the three drivers, the fundamental driving forces for, that set up the equation, if you want, and allow the equation to come into, uh, into being. I'm going to also talk about the three catalytic factors that are accelerating this equation being relevant now. And uh, those are the two things, the driving forces and the catalytic forces. And together, they mean we have to work on the, solving this equation right now. The imperative is now to solve this equation. I'm going to talk about the six things you need to do to solve this equation. Uh, and hopefully, in the course of that, uh, provide a view of the future that uh, compels us all to move together as an industry and as a set of operators and vendors coming together with an open ecosystem. I'm also, of course, going to then try and depict that reality by showing you a video where all those things, all those forces and factors come together and depict a future reality that is imminent, I would argue, and that's the key point. But let me start with the three driving forces. So that's where we set up the equation in terms of the driving forces, the things we're trying to solve for, if you like, in this new equation. Well, one is there has to be an economic imperative. Has to be a reason that the world needs to change, and normally that has a business uh, a reason or a business uh, driving force. So the economic imperative is increasing human productivity. It turns out that most economists agree that humanity as a species has, has come together over time to uh, form communities and collectives that allow us to work in concert to solve big problems and solve them efficiently. And that's what productivity is really all about, is is more goods produced per unit time by the same number of workers or even fewer workers. So productivity is the driver. And it turns out we haven't done a very good job up till now of increasing productivity in the digital age. We did a great job in the first and second industrial revolutions where we created machines and infrastructure that allowed us to do more uh, with, with our human capabilities. But in the internet age, we've mostly digitized uh, or increase the productivity of digital goods, things like media and content, which were relatively easy to uh, make available in a digital realm because they were already being stored and recorded digitally. And then we encoded them and shipped them physically to uh, the consumer who then played that physical good out over a digital medium. But if you see the physical part was really a little bit in the middle that we could eliminate by creating the internet. And that's what we've done with streaming technologies, both audio and video. We've created an entire end-to-end -end digital value chain. However, for most physical processes, most industrial systems, manufacturing systems, transportation systems, we haven't managed to digitize those things to the same extent because they're much harder. They're uniquely human and physical interactive systems that have very complex math and physics that explain how they work together or dictate how they work together. So we haven't done those things. We don't have 
autonomous vehicle systems. We don't have autonomous or intelligent infrastructure systems. We don't have intelligent logistics. We don't have intelligent mining or shipping. Uh, and we don't have intelligent human control functions. We can't do intelligent diagnosis. We can't do intelligent manipulation, coupling uh, humans and, and robotic systems. That missing uh, need or that gap is, is what we need to do. We need to digitize the physical world to increase human productivity. So that's driving force number one. For that to happen, of course, we need enabling technologies. So there are technology drivers in this equation. And, and they are in, in, uh, in set, in some total, the following. 5G. 5G I need to, to do uh, all the connectivity uh, and create the connectivity between the systems and the sensors and the robots that will control my physical world and allow me to interact with my physical world. 5G has very low latency, very high reliability, very high capacity and very high security. All of those things are very critical to allow me to interact with the intelligent sensors, systems and robots. So those intelligent sensors, systems and robots, they're important. They are the input and the output, if you like, uh, that, that allow 5G to operate on new data and also provide the control path for new actions, the new robotic systems. So sensors and robots are important as uh, tech drivers. And last, I would argue AI systems. In order for me to make sense of the wealth of data coming from sensors and send an action back to a robotic system, I need AI systems that help me operate on that data and make sense of it. So those are the tech drivers, 5G, AI systems, new intelligent sensors and robotics. Uh, and of course, I can't forget cloud because cloud would be a critical part of where I, I run the computation that allows me to uh, determine what the right outcome is for every task. So those are the tech enablers. And last, there's a, there's a human enabler, and we often forget this, but the human enabler uh, or need and driving force is uh, to augment me. I need to be able to do more than I can do with my native abilities, whether it's cognitively to think faster or physically to perform a task that I can't normally perform uh, adequately or, or as, uh, as quickly as I would like. So that's the last of the, of the great drivers is there's a human part, there's a business part, and there are tech drivers. And when those things come together, then uh, that's the driving set of, of forces that set up the value equation. Now, why will it happen now? It'll happen now because we see three clear catalysts for this change. One is COVID-19. We all know that uh, the current imperative for us to be able to remotely work or interact or connect or control uh, has never been clearer. COVID-19 and the pandemic has taught us we have to be able to work from anywhere and operate any task or perform any task uh, from any place, any time. And, and that's a catalytic imperative that uh, is now much more apparent than it was in the past. The second uh, catal catalyst for this uh, transition and setup of this new value equation is the movement towards edge clouds. I mentioned cloud as a technology, but the edge cloud is critical because it allows low latency, high reliability, high capacity and, and the ultimate security that I'm going to need to control these mission critical physical world systems. So the move to edge cloud and the, the movement of particularly the web scale cloud providers to offer web scale uh, type systems at the edge of the network is particularly important as a, as a catalytic enabler. And the last is open architectures. Think about uh, the world I'm describing where I've got sensory systems running over network systems to AI systems running in an edge cloud that then control robotic systems. That complex world uh, requires many systems to come together in an open, integrated, inclusive way to solve the holistic problem. So we need open architectures and ecosystems, both uh, open interfaces into systems, open source and open uh, network architectures as well. So that's a catalytic driver. The rise of that in the, in the current uh, tech industry is particularly important. So three drivers, three catalysts. When those things collide, we have an imperative to act now. And that's the critical point in this value equation. When you think of transitions humanity makes, uh, they're, they're always exponential in the end, but the first part of an exp exponential curve is linear. In fact, for those of you who like the maths, a Taylor series expansion of an exponential, the very first term is, is just linear. But as you progress through the series, the power terms start kicking in, and when those power law terms uh, come up, that's when you start seeing the very steep rise. 
but the reality is we all just see that initial phase as linear and think we've got an infinite amount of time to make the changes and investments we need to make. That isn't true because once those power terms kick in, of course, it's game over. Those who've made the early investments typically now become uh, massively successful and those who've missed making those investments in the linear regime, of course, are left behind. So the time to act is now. So let's talk about the six key investments you need to make. Uh, they are closely related to the three driving forces and the three catalytic forces uh, I just talked about. So let's get started. Number one, you need to build global advanced digital fabrics. The global interconnected digital fabrics of the future will be based on 5G radio access technology and fiber everywhere uh, access technologies that allow anyone anytime to interact over high performance connectivity tissue. Think about it in humanistic terms. We have a brain that allows us to interact with the physical world over a very high performance uh, connectivity tissue that is with inside our bodies. We now need to actually globalize that concept and allow humans to interact anywhere, anytime over high performance connectivity tissue, almost an external connectivity tissue to ourselves that allows us to interact remotely with machines and systems. So build advanced digital fabrics that act as that uh, high performance connectivity tissue. Related, build local or private networks that are the very high performance, very sensitive networks at the extremities. Those need specific characteristics to do with touch and latency and control and perception. So you need to build local private networks that are the extreme networks, the, the sensory networks right at the edge that connect to those global digital connectivity fabrics that I mentioned in point one. So two types of networks, one and two, global connectivity fabric, local connectivity fabrics. Number three, build upon web scale cloud infrastructure and platforms. Don't do what you don't have to do yourselves. Don't reinvent the wheel. The web scale infrastructure with its shift to the edge and the availability of those systems and platforms should be leveraged by our industry to accelerate the transformation both of how networks get built with dynamic adaptability and instantiation of network functions, as well as all the associated analytics and applications and services all of which have to be rendered and delivered within that latency interval. So all have to be done within that edge cloud interval. So build upon web scale infrastructure. Be open to partnerships. These complex systems I talked about with sensors interacting with AI systems over 5G networks and controlling robotic systems, uh, all with the edge cloud as, as, as the compute fabric, have to come together to operate as one. So we need new models with new partnerships rather than uh, just supplier and vendor type relationships. Be open to new business models. One of the best ways uh, we've invented as, as humans to consume services in this day and age is so-called as a service. What that means is you have instant access to anything, anytime from anywhere. The first moves in the digital world uh, allow businesses to go online so I could order something from anywhere, but I actually still had it delivered to me uh, it physically in many cases, whether a physical good or, 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 or media. Now, with the as-a-service model, I can access whatever I need from wherever I am without having to wait, and that's the as-a-service model. Everything is available to me on demand wherever I am because I can just command it at, at sort of at will. So move towards as-a-service type business models are critical. And last, remain and will be trusted. In the future, it's critical as we bring these uh, physical systems and industrial systems online that trusted entities provide many of the key capabilities that I've talked about. So we need dynamic, adaptive, low latency, high capacity, ultra secure systems that do all the, all the above. So those are the six things. So it's build global connectivity infrastructure, build local connectivity inf infrastructure, build upon web scale cloud, be open to new partnership models to solve the problem holistically and in an open, inclusive way. Be open to new business models of how you make those services available to others and be trusted. Those are the six key ingredients to solving the value equation. Now, let's uh, look at a real example of that. Of course, I'm talking about the future, so we've had to uh, emulate that. But uh, I'm going to now narrate for you a, a little video that highlights how the world will be in a few years' time, if I'm right. So here we are, uh, an exploration of the future, 
and we're driving towards the Nokia factory in an autonomous vehicle. And here we come, and you're going to see a drone. And I'll pause it right there. That drone is performing surveillance for us, looking around the environment to make sure that everything is secure and that nothing has been compromised or there's no intrusion or aberrant behavior. It's connected over a 4G network, and uh, which is upgradable to a 5G network in future. That's what the green line signifies. It's 4G today, 5G in future, uh, with an upgradable uh, radio network interface. So there it is, it's looking around, it's performing surveillance. Now, let's move forward. Of course, the drone is also avoiding the birds because it's under intelligent control. Now let's go inside the factory to see what's going on there. I'll pause it again just to orient you. There are some mechanical robots here. The red ones are performing manufacturing tasks and you're gonna see they're actually manufacturing uh, radio network components as well as drones themselves. So this is a reconfigurable, dynamically adaptive manufacturing line. But the important thing here is the different radio networks that are being used to control those systems. Yellow is Wi-Fi, good for data upload and download tasks, but not the most precise tasks. Blue is 5G millimeter wave, where the beams are directed to each individual component, offering the highest capacity and the lowest latency connectivity. And then green in the background is the combination of both LTE and 5G working on low to mid-band frequencies, offering a combination of different capabilities towards mid-latency, mid-reliability, uh, and mid-levels uh, uh, of um, capacity. So those are the three networks, and you see they're operating in concert. Wi-Fi for data upload and download, 4G, 5G for mid-capacity type, uh, mid-latency connectivity, and 5G in millimeter wave for the highest capacity, the lowest latency, the highest reliability. And each of those are operating and interacting with the robots you'll see here, the ones delivering components and the ones manufacturing the goods. So let's roll the video. There you see all that activity. And you see the different color panels, yellow Wi-Fi, green is LTE and 4G in combination, and blue beams are the precise 5G only low latency connectivity. And I want to show you right here. You see those two robots on the left-hand side? They are jointly cooperating to perform a task. Here they are jointly assembling a piece, and you're gonna see another example in a minute where one robot hands a component to another robot. That's the need for 5G. See, the 5G layer is critical to allow that precise interoperability of those two robotic systems as they assemble a component. So roll ahead and watch very carefully. And you will see, once again, in the middle here, one robot hands a component to another robot here. There you go, and puts it on the conveyor belt. So, now we go outside. Let's see what's gonna happen here. So reorient ourselves. We've manufactured something inside. We now need to, to move that. We need to transport that good to its destination. So here are the trucks. They're autonomous vehicles, of course, because this is in the future, and you're gonna see how they operate as a platoon. But here's how we do delivery to the truck. We do it using a drone. And the drone again is over that 5G high performance network in order to get the lowest latency and the highest reliability, uh, which we need for drone control. You see it dropped the package inside the truck and then it landed on the top of the truck. The star, by the way, denotes that it's a high priority package. That's why we used the drone to, to put the package inside the truck because the drone is actually now going to be part and parcel of the delivery system. So there it is sitting on top of the truck. The package is inside the truck. The truck is connected over 5G and you're going to see it now roll out onto the highway. So here we go. Watch those handoffs. Here are the handoffs between those millimeter wave small cells, allowing the truck to be autonomously controlled as well as all the data from the truck and systems to be uploaded to the edge cloud as it passes uh, along the highway. You're going to see that it's been determined by the Edge Cloud AI system that the package could be better delivered by another truck in the platoon. So there goes that drone again. It's going to go down into the truck in which it originally put the package, bring it back up under precise control from the AI system, and put it in a neighboring truck which has a more optimal route to the destination, all under 5G network control. Another task, of course, is to determine the right uh, operation of the platoon. There's a car ahead in this example. The platoon separates and navigates around the car, avoiding any danger or jeopardy to the car. And here we are at the harbor. The truck we just saw on the highway is coming towards this harbor and combining its cargo with that coming from a ship at sea. 
Everything in this harbor is under 5G control. The ships can be autonomously piloted towards the dock and docked under remote human supervision. Equally, the containers can be offloaded using those, those uh, massive cranes that take the containers off the ship and put them on the dockside. They're then picked up from the dockside and put on trucks where they're taken to their final destination. Everything under 5G control because of the critical latency, reliability, and security required for all those processes. So let's play it forward and see how that all comes together. Here we are. We're going to now zoom in on the crane side view. You'll see all the blue lines everywhere representing those 5G connections. You'll see the manifest being scanned from the ship so that the right container can be identified. You'll see the edge cloud kicking in. It's being used to control all these autonomous systems as well as do that manifest analysis. There it is. It then directs the autonomous vehicle to the right container space and the container is uh, picked up and placed on the destination delivery truck. And here we see that truck moving towards the exit, again under 5G control. You see one of the containers placed at the side there, under 5G control. This truck is being scanned, its cargo being analyzed, looking both for the uh, container load uh, that was placed upon it to make sure that's still intact, as well as scanning to see if our additional package that came from the Nokia factory is also on board. And you can see it identifies the additional package 0.65 kilograms of additional payload in addition to the container load coming from the ship. Everything is above board. The manifest is correctly updated and off we go. And that is the future. So just to recap, solving the future value equation will allow us to build intelligent mission critical infrastructures that massively increase human productivity with our example of logistics, manufacturing, transportation, infrastructure being just one of the examples uh, of how value can be uh, enhanced by solving the future value equation using the six investment methodologies and uh, imperatives that I identified. Thank you, Marcus, that was fantastic. Next up, we look at the positive impact of innovation and see how the technology we create is a fundamental part of building a better world. Based on the ethical choices we make, we'll look at how we can bridge the digital divide and provide access to education for more people to how we can grow in a sustainable way. Let's hear from Sandy Motley, who is the president of Fix Networks about building a better world. Hi, I'm Sandy Motley, the president of Fix Networks, and I'm very excited to be a part of Nokia Real Talk 2020. Like many of you, I'm thinking of not only the future of our industry, but also of the world in which we live. With the rate of change ever increasing, it's important to take the time to consider the broader implications of our technology and its development and the impacts on society. We at Nokia believe it's critical to act ethically and to provision sustainability, ensuring our choices are responsible ones. We should put people first. Technology should be used to make life better for everyone around the world. And we should promote equality. The gigabit error must deliver equal opportunities for everyone and must provide digital inclusion. We need to preserve and strengthen digital trust. Putting people first means respecting their rights to security and privacy in a world of unprecedented co-creation and sharing of data. And lastly, we must ensure sustainability. That is minimizing environmental impacts, which require smarter, more strategic approaches to infrastructure and to services. In today's world, fixed and mobile are both necessary and their integration provides a robust solution to bridge the digital divide. And to put people first, I believe we need to mandate broadband as a fundamental right. Broadband has played a vital role during the COVID-19 crisis and will continue to do so after as we move to a low-touch economy. Broadband is our lifeline to the world. 
keeping us connected to friends, delivering education to our children, and providing access to telemedicine. But imagine if you didn't have this lifeline. There are almost a billion households around the world without a fixed broadband connection. And on top of that, there are another half a billion with inadequate broadband services. These households are vulnerable, both socially and economically. They have reduced access to information, essential services, and connectivity to others. We need to come together to accelerate plans so everyone has access to affordable, high-speed broadband to internet services. And we need to educate all on the benefits of using the internet and online services. The path forward is to use multiple technologies to ensure business cases are viable, to use regulation to better support network sharing options, and for government to help create the right framework for affordable access. Ask anyone who has lived or is still living through lockdown to imagine what it would be like without their broadband connection. Ask businesses what would happen if their employees couldn't work from home or if customers couldn't buy online. Broadband has given many of us a degree of continuity in our lives. We owe the unconnected and the underserved the same opportunity. As we expand connectivity, we can see how newer access technologies enable a better world by also connecting everything. We can leverage innovations to improve the human condition and can use technology to solve societal, economical, and environmental challenges while making our world safer and while creating more business opportunities. So are you ready to see what the future could be if we work together? Are you ready to join us in building a better world? Thank you, Sandy. Some changes that we see today are the forerunner of much bigger changes tomorrow, which in turn will shape our future world. Our panel of futurists will explore how upcoming trends impact us, society and business, and their visions of what the world will look like with 5G as a critical enabler. Now I'll hand it over to Leslie Shannon, who is Nokia's head of ecosystem and trend scouting as she has a discussion with Kathy Hackle, who's a futurist and ARVR leader, and Elena Hiltunen, who is a futurist and author. Hello, and welcome to today's session, Seeing the Oak Tree in the Acorn, Reading Today's Signals of Massive Future, future Change. My name is Leslie Shannon. I am Nokia's Head of Ecosystem and Trend Scouting. And today I am joined by two futurists, who, both of whom I personally admire. So this is a very exciting session for me, and I, I know it's going to be for you as well. I'd like to introduce to you Elena, Elena Hiltonen and Kathy Hackle. Now, when we futurists use the word signals, that is something that we use to indicate small things that are happening that we can see around us today that are really the seeds of future change. You know, the, the, the acorn that will someday become an oak tree and the metaphor that we have as the title of this session. And so one of the things that I wanted to, to ask both of you is what are, what's the signal that you're seeing right now, signal or signals that is the indicator for the most significant change that you think is coming towards us in the next 10 years. Um, Kathy, you're nodding, so I'm gonna ask you first. <laughs> what yeah, is it, Leslie? Yeah, what's really striking you right now? There are two, two signals, and they're kind of part of the same signal in some ways that are really striking me right now. And they're both connected to exploration. And one of them is space exploration. So, uh, you know, everything that's happening in the space the new space race, let's say. And the other one is more on the virtual world. So exploration in those virtual worlds and that idea of world building. And these are kind of two of the signals that I'm tracking to that mean a massive, massive significant change to, to human behavior and to who we are as, you know, as workers, um, as, you know, families, et cetera. So uh, those are definitely the two that I'm tracking to right now very heavily. 
And and you kind of you said that they were connected together in a way. How do you see them actually connecting? Because when I when I put on a VR headset, for example, I, I'm not thinking about Mars. <laughs> so so where do you see them put, going together? It's about exploration between the finite world that we currently physical world that we live in. Right, so I think that that's the com the common denominator there. It's exploration outside of the current physical limitations that we have in in our current world, and then exploration into the digital space. So one is going, you know, interplanetary, and the other one going is going more into a virtual space, uh, where you know, if you think about interplanetary, um, it's harder to it's hard it's going to be hard to colonize. It's going to be hard to become a multiplanetary species. Um, whereas in world building, it's unlimited, right? It's truly unlimited what we can do. But they're both that sense of human exploration beyond the current finite physical world that we live in. Excellent, thank you. Elena, what's a signal that's, um, that's, that's striking you at the moment? Thank you, Leslie, for asking, because I have to say that I'm a true fan of weak signals. I did my PhD thesis about weak signals, but for me, they are very concrete examples. What is happening now? They are like something that you can spot and then you are like, wow, what is this? What is this happening there? A uh, couple of weak signals, a couple of examples. Nokia starting to build 4G network, network to the moon. I think that is cool weak signal. And then, for example, one weak signal is IKEA is starting to uh, build a, a department store that is only selling uh, used uh, furniture. So this is one example. Then, of course, I'm a technology enthusiastic myself, so I really I like to watch all the gadgets and so on, and especially if you think about CES. So all the things that are uh, uh, there on the show, on the CES, uh, so um, you can really think that they are the weak signals of today and they can be big things in the future. An example is a company that makes this parallel reality and it's a display and everybody can look at the same display and everybody is seeing the different kind of uh, stuff in the display. So even though they're looking at the same display, is, and are you talking about a physical physical display? Yeah, yeah. So that's quite unique thing that is happening, and of course, not to mention the neon, the vir virtual robot, virtual mm -hmm. avatar that was uh, also in this set. So I think that that is cool. If we um, go further into exploring the digital world, into exploring space, into expl having four G on the moon, um, what actually? will come from that. Um, what are the things that you see that we that we might be able to expect? Because that's actually where the real change tends to happen. Um, Kathy, do you, do you want to start? Yeah, I would say that some of those second order effects that you're that you're asking about, what could happen? What could this lead to, right? Um, I see, for example, from the space side of things, um, you know, obviously a whole new world of careers that are going to open up not only in in our physical world, but uh, off planetary, right? So um, I also, one of the things I like I like to think about when I'm thinking about what happens in the future, what are the potential futures, is I, I spend a lot of time listening to my kids because they are in some way those signals. They are, they. if you look, if you spend time with your kids, those signals are appear just, just by talking to them. Um, and I was talking to my daughter the other day and she's always talked about being, uh, you know, a chef or a food scientist. And she said to me last Saturday specifically, she said, mommy, I think I want to become a lunar food scientist. Hmm. And How I was like, that was, she's 10, she's 10. Wow, she's oh, 10. Cool. She said, I want to become a lunar food scientist because I've been talking a lot about space with them and uh, a lot of things that are happening, you know, here in the US and abroad and, and kind of this new space race of sorts. And that to me was a signal that if we become, you know, if we start, if we get back to the moon, if we start, you know, going towards Mars um, and, you know, terraforming in some way, this is going to open up opportunities that children didn't really see before, right? New jobs. What are those jobs of the future, right? Is it going to be limited to jobs here on Earth? Um, so, you know, for her to say to me, I want to become a lunar food scientist, signal to me 
that she's seen opportunities beyond just this world. So obviously that opens up a whole bunch of, whole bunch of second, you know, second order effects. Like how do you recruit for the moon? How, how do you get people on the moon, et cetera? Um, how, do, how do people communicate? What are the communication systems that we in place for me to communicate with my daughter when she is a lunar food scientist, right? Um, what are we the nutritional value of you know these uh, foods that she will grow on 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 the moon? So those are in that sense from the space side, that's a second order effect. Elena, uh, let's bring you in here. What uh, what second order effects um, are you seeing from the signals that uh, that are most significant to you right now? Well, I see actually a couple of things that I would like to lift here. So uh, one of them is uh, human technology interaction. So human and technology is going to merge uh, even more and more in the future. And we are already merged with the technology. I have this polar uh, smartwatch that is tracking my my movements and, and how many steps I take and, and my pulse and so on. But I also used to have this NFC chip installed uh, in my hand. It's, it was um, here in my hand under the skin and I used that as a key to my house. So I had an electric lock. So I just waved my hand and the lock recognized me because of the NFC chip. I didn't have it anymore. I, I took it away, but I had it for one and a five years and it was <laughs> amazing. I never forgot my keys to my phone. <laughs> I always. But, um, anyway, I think that this is more and more going to happen. Of course, not everybody is going to have chips installed and so on. But uh, for example, here in Finland, one bank was introducing a, a possibility to have a ring in your finger that has NFC chip. And then when you go to the shop, you you can just pay with the ring. So that is, I think that that is going to be the future that we are going to emerge uh, more with the technology. And we are going to be a little, little bit more like cyborgs. But Leslie, as I'm looking to you, you are a cyborg already. You have your headphones and you have uh, <laughs> eyeglasses <laughs> on and, and they are like technology that is making you to see better and making you to hear my voice and so on. So we are already cyborgs. But then the other thing, which I think it's very important, it's it's the sustainability, circular economy and these things, because uh, if we don't have the planet, we, we can't yeah. be the technology or anything. So this is very important, and especially when you think about the uh, electric waste. So this is a big issue, and, and the, these things are something that you should take very carefully, and, and companies are also taking very carefully and, and considering these issues. But in the future, we might have problems how to get certain minerals and, and so certain uh, metals. And that's why we need to emphasize more on the circular economy to make more out of little stuff. So, so I think that that is something that every company, no matter in what industry they are, but, but every company has to, has to go to that direction. I pay a lot of attention to dystopian views of the future because that helps us understand what we don't want to have happen, right? So it's important to watch Terminator and to think about, you know, robots out of control so that we can make sure that we don't actually have that future come to pass. Um, but it, uh, uh, Leslie, I have to say yeah. here that it's also very important to have these kind of like positive views of the future, not only to see future as a dystopian uh, robots are uh, killing all us, future because that actually gives uh, people uh, the feeling of hopelessness about the future. And now we have to also think about positive futures and how can we do these positive futures. As you said that Nokia has this circular economy team, this is how you are making the positive future. By creating absolutely, this. absolutely. And so uh, one of the things that I love when you look at all of the uh, innovations in, um, in Star Trek, for example, every single one of them actually is now possible, except for yeah. teleportation. <laughs> and so, right. And so, you know, and so we can 3D print food, for example, and maybe, maybe Kathy, maybe that's what your daughter is going to get into as her, uh, as, as a lunar food scientist, maybe it's 3D printing. <laughs> And Kathy, you have done very good work because I think that technology is going to be so big part of our life that in the future we also need more women and more girls 
that are doing the science work there and thinking about the technologies and especially when we think about the algorithms, how much power they have in our lives. So we need to have the uh, women coders to yeah. not to give that to the uh, men the, this task. We need women too. Yeah. We, need, we need the actually smartest brains to do this kind of like technological new innovation and, and uh, those brains also women and male have those brains. Yeah. So. And, and, and to that point, Elena, I, I, I started the uh, Kathy Hackle Scholarship for Women with the VRAR Association. People think, you know, scholarship and they need to be a Rockefeller. No, it, you don't have to be, <laughs> you know, um, a baron of any sorts to start a scholarship. You can start small. And what I did is I created one scholarship to help one woman. I gave her um, membership to the association and mentorship one on one with me. And my hope is to grow the scholarship because I I'm on a mission. One of my missions is to get more women and minorities into the virtual reality and augmented reality industry, because as we create these worlds, we need different points of view. We don't need just one specific point of view. We need such a diverse point of view uh, in every sense of the word, cognitive, you know, and, and, and racial, uh, religious, like we need so many diverse point of views so that whatever we build in this virtual space is more representative of who we are. That's so important that you said, and uh, I like Kathy your attitude that you have this uh, uh, mentoring uh, system and so on. And and that is an explan a very good example that we all can do something about to make the better future. I have this uh, project called Science for Girls, and I try to encourage even little girls to start to be interested in technology because sometimes these technology toys have been very like boy oriented toys. So I I think that they need princess fairy tales of technology. This is my mission there, to have them interested in technology too. So so these are some really interesting views of the future um, that you're both talking about. Now, if anybody is is interested in learning more about futures thinking or, or how to kind of start incorporating the future into their lives today, um, what are some of the things that you would suggest that our audience actually seek out and experience? Um, uh, how can they learn more about the future? Alina. Well, I think that you have to learn the facts. I have this uh, e equation uh, for the future is like fu anticipation the future equals facts but plus imagination. So you have to know the facts, what is happening. So read books, listen to podcasts, look at the documentaries from um, TV and also do something weird. This is my weird stuff, what I'm doing. This is horrible. <laughs> Oh, that's crocheted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, little duff can there. Yeah, <laughs> but also it, it's not so much academic. Do also something wild. And Kathy, what would you recommend? I love that idea of being, you know, doing something weird. Absolutely love that. Um, and I'm going to re recommend something maybe not as analog. I would say if you really want to explore these technologies and better understand where the you know where the technology is going, where the signal where the signals are pointing to, definitely you know put on a headset, look, find out what's in there, what kind of content is there, what kind of things can you do? Um, you know, once we get back to some level of normalcy and you can go to you know to a trade show where there might be technology, get your hands on on these things. For example, at CES, I was able to. Uh, demo a similar headset to this. This is a brain computer interface uh, device that allows and you me put it to on your head. On. Yeah, and you put it on your head. It's like this. I'll leave it on. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks very fashionable. Um, yeah, you're able to kind of like turn on lights with it. You're able to kind of just using your thoughts, by the way, just reading your brain. I don't have to do anything or scroll an iPad. Um, so getting, get, you're trying these technologies, connecting with people that are, you know, that are seeing these weak, weak signals, I think is incredibly important. Um, but yeah, don't get, don't be scared to, 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 you know, do something weird. For me, the really fundamental change that 5G is bringing is the concept of splitting the chip. This, this idea that, that, you know, um, now we've got these kind of, you know, supercomputer level chips on our end devices, but that means that they're very expensive. Uh, they're heavy, they have a short battery life. Um, and, and what 5G allows is to have end devices that are as light and as cheap and as low power and as um, long battery life as possible 
with the minimum processing on them, and this is where you start getting, you know, augmented reality headsets that look like normal glasses when they're as light and as cheap as possible. And then 5G is the connection to the rest of the processing that is sitting at the network edge somewhere. And so it's, and which, and now if you don't have to worry about having the end user purchase that device, you don't have to have just one GPU, one graphical processing unit. You can have a whole stack of them, like NVIDIA is putting stacks of 40 GPUs mm -hmm. into their network edge. And, and, um, and that splitting the chip, that is actually the thing that's really going to power this next wave of so many of the devices that are at the heart of the kinds of changes that we're talking about. So lighter, um, you know, augmented reality headsets that are coming over the next couple of years and the same, uh, 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 the same structure for enabling uh, robots and drones to have these light, cheap things and sensors of all kinds out there connected over 5G to super duper processing at the network edge. And so, um, so I see that both of you are nodding. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I know that both of you are you're probably not so focused on the telco arm of this, but um, but thinking about kind of that, that, that splitting the chip and the lighter, cheaper end device, mm -hmm. um, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of things are you seeing that that, that structure will enable in the future? Um, Alina, do you have, uh, does anything come to mind for you? Yeah, yes. Uh, well, I think that uh, 5G is one that makes it possible, for example, when we are thinking about smart cities and, and we can save energy and, and we can actually uh, have uh, much smarter traffic, uh, not traffic jams at all, and these kind of things. So I think that it has many possible possibilities in, in many areas of life. If we think about your education, having this kind of virtual reality education, educational classes, you could travel in time. You could go back to the history to look at what, ha what has happened in, in the ancient Rome or something. And uh, so, so it has, it is full of possibilities. So I have to say, I'm really expecting that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody is actually. <laughs> yeah, as a technology enthusiast, I'm really waiting that to happen. Many possibilities there. And 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 Kathy, what uh, what comes to mind when you're thinking about 5G and its connection to the future? Yeah, I definitely think 5G is moving us in that way, you know, away from CPUs into GPUs being the most important thing. Um, mm. And like you said, it's an enabler. It's going to allow us. It's going to be the enabler that's going to allow what I call the Ray-Ban moment, which you mentioned when we were in these sleek glasses and we're going to have content in front of us. And I think for, you know, for communication service providers, what they need to start thinking about uh, when it comes to 5G and when it comes to these technologies is how does that impact my, you know, the small business consumer or the medium-sized consumer um, and it's and we get into the whole idea of spatial programming, right? Right now, if I'm if I'm a consumer and I'm on my phone and I'm walking to a restaurant, I'm checking the reviews, uh, but that eventually is going to move from my cell phone into my headset. So what does that look like when people are actually looking at it in a spatial way? And that's called spatial programming. How are you going to enable those medium and you know those small to medium businesses and even the enterprise to allow for the spatial programming in a spatial plane? And I think the other thing that is really critical, um, Leslie, and you and I have, have talked about this, is 5G is going to enable uh, the world to become machine readable. It's going to enable the world to become machine readable, to be, you know, clickable, searchable, likable. And in some ways, it's going to allow for us to meet the machine. We're going to meet the machines in this virtual space and be able to communicate in a different world. Uh, so, yeah, very excited about the possibilities of 5G for everyone from, you know, com communication service providers and beyond. I have to say that I'm very enthusiastic about uh, smart dust, which uh, means that we can have these very tiny, tiny sensors and we could, for example, paint the wall with this smart dust and then the wall could react to the uh, carbon dioxide level of the room and, and then send uh, alarms to my mobile phone that, okay, now open the window or something. So we can have like uh, uh, computers everywhere and, and tiny computers everywhere that could help us and uh, in a way like save energy and and uh, and uh, to make our health better and so on to grow food better so so there's huge possibilities with this new connectivity and, and i think that combining if you combine spatial computing with iot sensors and 5g we're going to truly unleash the potential of big data and data analytics in a totally different level we've never seen before and absolutely the new level of that because the, there's more and more data coming yeah
one of the things that I see is that it's it's not just that that this siloed thing is happening and this siloed thing is happening it's that all of these things are happening together as as you all were just mentioning and so so we have visual analytics and iot sensors and spatial computing all of these things coming in at the same time and so it's going to be how they all weave together that is actually going to be the thing that is truly truly life-changing and so um elena and kathy thank you very much for an uh, a wide-ranging and stimulating conversation and I hope we've uh, put some new ideas into the thoughts of our of our listeners today. And um, let's all go out there and make the world a better place. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both very Thank much. You. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. We'll see you in the future. All right, that was such an excellent panel. And I wanted to check in with some of the comments that are coming in. And just a reminder, if you have a question, please ask it in the stream. We have experts on hand from all the sessions who will be able to answer your questions or talk to you in the chat. So let's go to a couple of the comments that have come in. It was empowering to see three women talking about technology and what a great point that we need more women coding algorithms for the virtual world to build a better world and make the future as inclusive as possible. It's important to incorporate diverse views from women and minorities to ensure equality. Great comment. Uh, a few more here. Interesting to hear that the seeds of so many innovations are already present in the market. The brain computer interface that Kathy showed us allows you to use your thoughts to switch on the lights or scroll on your tablet. That will be a massive quality of life improvement for those with disabilities. Really good point. Uh, a couple more. Wow, a lunar food scientist, what a great job. And there will be plenty more unexpected jobs like that in the future. These weak signals indicate how broadly we need to think about the changes that are ahead of us. And finally, 5G really will be an important technology in the future, along with video analytics and IoT. It will allow the world to become more machine readable. So remember, keep your comments coming. All right, next up, just when people are still talking about a continued slowdown over the past decade compounded by COVID-19, the world could actually be on the cusp of a transformational acceleration in productivity growth. I talked to Graham Leach, who is the CEO and chief economist of macroeconomics, to look at the numerous reasons 5G promises to be transformative for the economy. Hello, Graham. It's great to see you, and thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure. Productivity is a difficult term to define. How would you describe productivity? Back to first principles, and what drives the economy in the long term, not in the short term, in the next couple of months, or, but on a kind of long term decadal basis, what, what, what would be the determining factors? And there, it's changing the quality and the quantity of labor employed, uh, the quantity and quality of investment. And then it's the effectiveness which we use the two together, which is called total factor productivity. A bit boring, but the key thing there is that is the determinant in the long term of economic growth in the economy. And, and it's, that is the efficiency with which we bring investment and people together. So it's pretty down foundational and it's absolutely crucial. And one of the uh, amazing factors over the last decade has been that despite the fact that we've been undergoing a technological revolution, when you would expect positivity growth to surge, well, it hasn't. And there's been talk about secular stagnation, which is just economics jargon for hardly any growth in productivity. And now, of course, in the wake of COVID as well, People are saying, well, you know, it's been bad over the last decade. It's going to be even worse over the coming decade. And at this point, I think it, this is precisely a long time in history to be looking at the road ahead through the rearview mirror. Um, and that's what everybody's doing at the moment. And they're missing what I would call the great inflection, the V-shaped surge back, the Nike swoosh where it's been really low and now it begins to accelerate. I'm not saying that happens immediately. There will be lags here, but what is clear is that this is probably the worst point in economic history to be downbeat. This is a bit like at the beginning of the 19th century, 
um, Thomas Malthus wrote a book which became the Seminoles on Treaties on Population and Economics. And basically, he said, look, what's happened for the last 2,000 years is hardly in any growth. And we're going to go on for the next 2,000 years with hardly any growth. And what the key thing is there, of course, that when he was going that way, the economy suddenly went that way. And it spiked upwards. And I believe that when we immediately this is the opportunity for the world economy in the 2020s and into the 2030s to grasp the benefits of technology. And then if we go back to my initial description of productivity and what it is. So you've got growth in labour, which is becoming more difficult because you've got ageing population um, and you haven't got so many people coming through in terms of working population as, it, as in the past. And so you, we, and we need something to really, really drive growth forward. And that last great hope um, is productivity growth. And the key there to productivity growth is going to be the efficiency with which we bring capital and labor together to create the business and entrepreneurial ideas and the innovators and the innovations of the coming decades, which will ultimately drive growth. Why do you think we'll see an upsurge in productivity growth over the next 10 years driven by 5G? Why would the economy start growing more fast in the 2020s than it did in the 2010s and indeed in the, the 2000s? What's going on here? And I would argue that the, what's going on is 5G and its combination with Internet of Things um, and how it brings together technologies to accelerate um, economic growth. And one of the key factors here we are arguing is that technology, 5G, they're what we would call a general person, general purpose technology, GPTs in the jargon. And GPTs are what set, change the curve. Those are, those are the factors which turn the curve upwards because of a new technology, which not only impacts it own, in its own sector, it enables a whole swathe of other type technologies in the, uh, at the same time as well. So it brings other ideas and business ideas and entrepreneurs into the process because they see the impact of 5G on their sector and they've thought of a new model of delivery um, in the wake of that. So general purpose technologies, they're absolutely enormous. Um, and they don't come around every day. I mean, the classic example of general purpose technology is electricity. Electricity was, there, was, there were power stations, there were, there were, the, the technology was there in the 1880s, but it wasn't until the, 20, uh, the, the 1920s that we had the roaring 20s when the effects of technology in terms of electricity spread out across the whole economy and really began to impact growth and of course, then we had the phrase, the roaring 20s. And we could repeat that. It could be the 2020s, like the 1920s. And there are similarities in other ways as well. Because after the First World War, we had the Spanish flu. And then we had the roaring 20s. So let's hope after COVID-19, we get the roaring 2020s. Is the real game changer not just technology, but also connectivity? The big change now with 5G from 4G or 3G is the way it will combine with other technologies. So you've got AI, Internet of Things, all these things are brought together uh, with 5G in a way they haven't in the past. So the past is a, a very poor predictor of the future. And just as it was just as the Reverend Thomas Malthus made that mistake 200 years ago, we risk making the same mistake again. Um, if we don't really look at how this surge is just going to enable so many different things. So many different things that we've talked about, which haven't yet happened, will begin to happen. So smart cities on a truly global scale. And in, in addition to that, autonomous vehicles. Everybody's been talking about these for many years, but it's only with 5G that we'll see plans transferred into action. When we talk about 5G technology, who are the biggest winners? The impact of new technology has been very much focused on the consumer side. We've seen the smartphones, we've seen all the kits which has gone along with it, but it's going to be different this time. So instead of being consumer focused, the boost of productivity in the 2020s and beyond is going to be from a, a producer perspective. And very often in economic history, you see that actually the producer effect was the biggest effect, but it wasn't at all obvious. And so the economy as we see it today may not look dramatically different to the one um, 
that appears over the coming decades, at least in terms of the, the standard day, daily grind, as it were. Uh, yes, there will be some change, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, but you're not going to see a massive change there. Um, so I think that outside of actually the autonomous vehicles, it won't be that visual, but that doesn't mean it won't be that impactful. It is going to be tremendous because, again, this key point that 5G enables so many other technologies as well and brings them um, to a tipping point. There was a fascinating survey a few years for the World Economic Forum, which surveyed, I think, a couple of thousand chief technology officers around the world. And in technology after technology after technology, they said the tipping point to achieve mass market status would be by the middle of the 2020s. Are there any real watchouts when we talk about this technological transformation? One of the biggest issues, and we're already seeing the, the, the rolling hills of it, and the mountains won't get very steep, but they will at some point become a real tension between the rapidity of technological change and the impact on employment as a consequence. And what you find at the moment is very interesting, is that those who are most optimistic about the technology are the least optimistic about the employment consequences. In other words, they see widespread technological unemployment. And that technological unemployment has led to a whole swathe of ideas becoming um, very, very, very much center scene in terms of the policy impact. And that is that what will happen? How do we manage this situation where you could have mass market unemployment? At the same time, we just got revolutionary economic change. Well, I think I differ with the change there because I'm very optimistic on the employment front and on the technology impact as well. In other words, I think rapid popular, uh, technology growth is going to facilitate all sorts of effects. And people that are just being too narrow at the moment, they're looking at the initial direct impact of technology on um, employment, what you've got to do is think about all the indirect effects and the induced effects with come. What about all those elements in the supply chain? And what about in terms of induced effects? What about all those high salary jobs which will now have spent in the local economy? Yes, there will be a problem because not all the jobs lost will be in the places where the jobs are gained. So there will be a mismatch there. But it's a very exciting prospect. I, but with, the phrase is this time it's different. Well, I, 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 I beg to differ. I think this time it's not different. And this time we could actually see not only a very powerful direct impact in a positive sense, but possibly an even more impact in terms of the indirect and induced effects. So still favor the, the optimistic world. It's got to be cautious though. Um, and as I say, there will be those mismatches should we be excited about technologies that we haven't really thought about yet? There will be new companies. The entrepreneurs of today and tomorrow, they will dream up the ideas that will actually define the years to come. And if we could predict all of them now, we'd all go away and make our fortunes, wouldn't we? It's not, but uh, it's not that easy. It, the future of the economy is in the minds of those entrepreneurs and innovators who will actually deliver it. How do you think technology and 5G will impact the public sector, especially when it comes to things like productivity? One of the biggest issues looking at the economic impact of the public sector is this classic problem, which is not just in the public sector, it's in the private sector as well. But when you've got very people facing services in education or in the NHS, whatever it might be, in those people centered uh, uh, services, it's very difficult to boost productivity. And now for the first time with the bringing the, um, uh, and the whole swathe of technologies together, it's showing us actually we've got the opportunity now. We can potentially transform public sector uh, productivity in a way that does not even envisaged before. But as you can combine AI with robotics and other issues, suddenly productivity comes into play in the public sector for the first time as well. Everybody's sort of it's, it's said it's in the too hard to do uh, tick box. And, and that's been the attitude in the past. But in the future, I think it's going to be very different. Do ecosystems and supply chains have to transform together to adopt 5G? One of the biggest issues here um, is, is the impact of technology and the revolution 
um, in new technologies and the way they interact with each other and what that means in the long term for the nature of globalization. Will we see far more offshoring because the technology in 5G permits the transfer of knowledge in a way that has not been possible before? And so you get that, you get, so you get even more um, economic activity pushed offshore. Or well, actually, does it do precisely the opposite of that? Does the uh, does technology so remove um, employment that you can operate it anywhere in the world and you can do 3D printing of products in Ohio in the same way um, you could do anywhere else? And so that that tension between onshoring and offshoring is going to reverse. Uh, range considerably across companies and across sectors, but it is going to have that um, impact. And I suppose one might say at the present time, a key influence there and something which is uh, accelerating um, this ten tendency is COVID-19. Does the experience of working online and working in new ways, does it actually trigger a fundamental reassessment of business processes. Can you talk a little bit about 5G's impact on so-called hidden technologies? Hidden technologies are all those technologies which are there behind the scenes. And actually, um, in a long-term economic uh, consequence, then hidden technologies are a lot more powerful than, than those which are more in open view, because it's the processes, it's the change of management structures, it's the change of organizational structure, which um, results at the end of the day with the process still looks like a mobile phone, but the way it's produced and the cost structure of that and the productivity against cost nations and how 5G enables that information flow in a, in a way hitherto not possible. So these hidden effects may not necessarily mean that the, 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 the phone in your pocket or whatever it might be looks dramatically different, but its capabilities um, and its reach are extended massively through 5G. Do you think the pandemic will be a tipping point for businesses to think beyond just growth and profit? I think there's a fascinating picture emerging um, as we progress in the early years of the 2020s, because what is really changing there is something which is, is not completely new. It is it's something which we saw a century ago. Um, we, we saw electricity, the technology being there in the 1870s and the 1880s, but it didn't impact the automated um, car assembly line with Henry Ford until 1913. Um, and then the demonstration effect there, as other companies saw the capabilities and the potential of that, that tech, new technology to impact their sector as well. And then the suppliers for those companies had a similar experience. And so there's absolutely limitless potential of these general purpose technologies. Uh, you, the car built by uh, or an automated production process in 1913 didn't look a whole lot different from a, um, uh, a car built 10 years before that with much with, without automated assembly. Um, but what went on, on behind the scenes, it was absolutely massive and it transformed the economy. And I think we're looking at a similar picture now. And if we do look to whether you're talking about electricity or the automated assembly line and how that fed out across the whole swathe of the sectors, that is the parallel I think we face now. That is why um, the, the, the technological revolution in the 2020s will start to deliver um, just as electricity and just as automated production. Those technologies had to wait for quite some time to have a big macro impact. Well, we're on a journey, aren't we? We've gone from 3G to 4G, now 5G. But 5G is a step change, different, just as in a technological sense, it's a step change. It's an e economically, it's a step change as well. Do you think there's a danger that we're overestimating the impact of some of these new technologies? The mistake we always make is that we tend to overstate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate its impact in the long term. Are we making that mistake again now? It's been great chatting with you. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much.
a reminder for all of you who are watching live online that if you want to get in touch with one of our experts, it's easy to do so. All you have to do is reach out via the contact form, which will be found in the chat across all of the platforms where we are streaming. Now in our final segment, Reza Sabanovic is the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Teliner Group, who will talk about how they continue to connect their customers to what matters most, even in changing and challenging times. With digitalization as a cornerstone to their strategy, they share how to enable a better customer experience for those in emerging markets and developed markets, creating more opportunity for all of us. Hello everyone and uh, thank you for the opportunity for Telenor to be present today with you. In Telenor, uh, we exist to connect you what matters the most, empowering society. And while I have this nice opportunity uh, to spend time with you, our more than 18,000 colleagues are working very hard every second, every minute to provide a good quality, reliable and secure services that are relevant and that matters to them across our nine markets in Asia and Europe. More than 87% of the data traffic that you see that is being produced while we are talking here is served from the Telenor Hybrid Cloud platform developed in the joint collaboration with Nokia. Let us start with reflecting a bit where are we today. And uh, March 2020 has been the time where a lot of things have changed. And what we want to talk about is the way how the COVID has impacted the way Telenor runs, runs the business and what changes we have been exposed in this uh, period. But before we touch upon that, let us first go to Bangladesh. So welcome to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a, a country of more than 160 million uh, inhabitants and Telenor through its affiliate Grameen Phone has the majority of our customer base, more than 75 million active subscribers. It's a quite cash heavy market and uh, economy built on the physical interaction and that applies for our industry as well. So in order to buy the service, recharge the services, you need to go to the small shops, the cigarette stands in order to perform that. Now, having that into the perspective of the COVID, uh, you would realize that uh, quite uh, a few hundred of a thousand of the point of sales that we have in Bangladesh have been not reachable uh, to our customers. And uh, half of those shops when the, in March, when the COVID hit, got closed, and that had a major impact on millions of our customers. And one of those customers is a gentleman that we see on the picture. It's Arad Sharir bin Kamal, who is, we can say, a representative of majority of our customer base. So who is Rad? Rad is a young professional, still not able uh, to get the postpaid uh, card, so he's having a prepaid recharging two to three times a week, using data uh, for his main services beside the voice. And he has a bank account, which is uh, very important for Bangladesh. And he's also using the uh, largest mobile wallet uh, payment provider, Bcash. In the context of the uh, situation of COVID, where those access to the physical recharge are closed, there is a major challenge for all our customer to continue the lives they used before the COVID-19. So what's the job that we need to do in order to enable our customer and to enable and connect our customer to what matters the most is to basically connect them uh, over the digital channels and digital platforms. But that is easier said than done, knowing uh, that we are in Bangladesh and knowing the fact that this is still the cash economy and the physical interaction does matter. So what happened? In order to really develop that interaction, now we are moving from the physical to digital interaction, 
Our colleagues in Bangladesh, in Grameen Fund, uh, needed to act very fast. But not only to act fast, we needed to build as well the capabilities that Bangladesh and Grameen Fund didn't have before to the extent required now, which is the payment. So they had to connect uh, to quite a few of the, um, uh, of, of, of the payment solutions, including the Bcash and the banks, in order to communicate to our customer the other opportunity to basically use the services that Grameen Phone has. It took them only a few days in the COVID time, complete lockdown, to enable our customer to connect to the platform and use the payment methodology and get the services and recharge that they want. And what was uh, the achievement? Basically, 50% uh, of, the, um, of the recharge has been increased in my app. It's uh, the GP app, where the customer uh, been using it uh, for the connecting for the GP services, Grameen phone services. So we saw the, a significant surge in the traffic in that application. And we, we saw as well that 43% plus recharge growth across all the digital platform. Uh, it was on the, uh, the GP, uh, Grameen Phone app, my GP, but as well on the websites. So what did this actually show to Telenor? That in case of need and in case of urgency, the adaptation and shift for the established practices and dealing with the physical interaction is possible. So the change and, uh, is driven by the need of it. And we saw that the, the, our customers found a way, first of all, to conclude the whole customer journey, get the payment at the same time to fulfill their needs and connect to the services that matters the most for them. But Bangladesh is just one of our nine markets that been hit with the same challenge and it's just one of many markets across the globe that they were exposed uh, to, the same, um, to the same challenge. And that's why we strongly believe that our purpose of existence, which is, again, connecting you what matters the most and empowering society, stands much stronger than ever before. And it is very important for us to say that to do that, it is not only Telenor that needs to act. It is the whole ecosystem and partners that we are connected. Uh, but before we dig a bit more on the uh, consequences and implication on the COVID-19 on our business model and the way how we serve our customers, we would like uh, to touch upon a bit what we have done before the COVID and what we believe set Telenor to perform maybe better than the others in those markets. Telenor has embarked on the modernization and digitalization journey since 2016. And we have been very clear in our ambition that digitalization is the way to go. Acknowledging all the challenges that that is going to uh, uh, be met on our journey, and as well the need to spend enormous time and efforts for us uh, to as well perform the proper adaptation and adjust to uh, the markets where the digitalization and the payment is not present to the extent it is required. So starting with the technology, uh, very early in 2016, we have made the very clear decision and direction that we are moving to, uh, to the cloud-based scalable networks. What does it mean? You saw, and Nokia has been our selected partner since 2016, Today, we have uh, more than 87% of the whole data traffic generated in Telenor network in nine markets being served from the Telenor hybrid uh, uh, platform, which is uh, done together with uh, Nokia. And we believe by moving all the applications and uh, the, both network and IT, we are enabling uh, a very uh, scalable, uh, very uh, efficient and much faster solution and services to our customer. 55% of our network workload is now operated from the cloud setup and close to 40% of the IT applications. The second pillar that we have put quite a lot of focus is digitalization of the customer journeys. 
My Telenor app, adop adopted uh, across the markets, has been the main engagement platform and main engagement tool for us to communicate and serve our customers. And we saw during the COVID that uh, my Telenor, or as we heard, my GP, uh, my Grameen phone app, served a purpose and basically got quite a bit of the effect of coming and staying closer to our customer in the digital uh, uh, world and still maintaining a good quality services and dealing with the requirements and requests of our customer timely, providing the relevant services. That journey will continue, and we are now digitalizing not only the interactions towards the end users, but the whole supply chain and the whole sales and distribution channels, digitalizing all the interactions with our partners across. But to do that, we as well believe that we need to modernize the way how we work and that we need to change our organizational setup to deal with that. Of course, agile way of work is integrated in everything what we do, but we are going even beyond that, introducing a flexible way of work and different expectations we will touch upon later on the leadership in this challenging time to really empower as well our employees and show the trust for them to execute uh, what is expected from us. And of course, uh, building the needed co competencies and capabilities so 15% of our total workforce is uh, uh, basically working in those identified critical competencies, among which is a customer facing uh, IT, data analytics, cybersecurity, cloud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the last one is the smart investments. How do we use all the intelligence and all the AIs that we have? developed and been uh, working with our partners in, in order to make the right choices uh, uh, and we invest where it matters the most. As well, at the same time, based on the scale and the volume game, build the central capabilities in procurement, our Telenor procurement company, to really accelerate and deliver on those synergies and value for Telenor. So we have been working on that since 2016 very diligently, but what we as well realize that by doing and working uh, with all of these capabilities, we are able to deliver the services where it mattered to our customers in the most difficult time during uh, the COVID. So just some examples to share with you. Five out of our nine business units were providing the services completely remote. There was a, a no man staff on the knock and the sock of the Telenor operation, which of course would not be possible if we have not embarked on our journey uh, on the common delivery center and working among others with Nokia in Pakistan and in Denmark in order to really automate and bring the AI and machine learning in all our operational processes, as well as the processes that are servicing our customers. But all nine business units basically has those capabilities and has the setup and processes that can operate remotely. Uh, not only that we can operate our network remotely, but it is very impressive to see that not a single business unit has a delay in their rollout and the development and capacity plans. So all the radio planning processes, all the optimization and in, uh, all the processes to uh, serve the customer in the best way has been running as planned. It's not only network that has been impacted, and uh, we heard uh, the story about the Bangladesh, but that story is common across all our markets. Now we are in Malaysia, uh, where uh, suddenly whole Malaysia got into lockdown and uh, our customers could not uh, reach the point of sales or the customer uh, center in order uh, to deal with their challenges. So the whole customer center, uh, centers were moved at homes. So the call centers were able to perform all the customer requests and complaints remotely because we have been doing this modernization and because we enable our uh, call center agent to use those tools remotely and to serve the customers so that we stick to our promise, which is reliable services that are relevant and that are important for our customers. We saw a major surge particularly in uh, Asian business unit in data. 
In same Malaysia, we went up to 40% data traffic increase during the peak of the lockdown and concentrated in the uh, uh, home and um, urban areas. To serve that, we understood that we need to open up the channels to our customers. Uh, so only in four days, our Malaysian DG team managed to basically uh, migrate the DG shops to online shops. And uh, using the Facebook and WhatsApp and other social media, connect to our customer, inform them and direct them to online shops. So that we, first of all, can serve their needs, can communicate to them, stay connected, particularly important in the challenging time of COVID, keep the information flow, uh, flow to them and enable them to purchase the services that they like. Again, uh, something that uh, we, before COVID and before 2016, thought it is uh, a long journey ahead. Again, building the competencies and capabilities systematically is paying out. But it is, again, not about the network, and it's not about the sales and distribution, it all boils down on the people. How do we operate? How do we run the business? How do we interact internally? It's extremely important, knowing that more than 90% of Telenor employees, as well as our partners, are working from home. How do we basically equip our employees with the proper tools, with the proper dialogue and connection to Telenor in order to perform their jobs? because none of our activities for 2020 has been basically put on hold or postponed due to the COVID. And to do that, we definitely need a different uh, type of leadership and we need a different way of interacting with our colleagues. Video becomes our new tool, uh, which uh, luckily worked quite well. But as well, we needed to make sure that each of these instances are secured so that each of our employees and each of data of Telenor and our customers are handled in the trusted and secured way. And at the same time, basically enable our teams and our employees to perform their job through the empowerment and to the trust-based leadership. Leaders are expected, of course, to set the right directions. And that's our new concept that is launched, tight, loose, tight where in the first tight, we set a very clear directions and expectations. Then we empower our um, employees to the trust-driven uh, leadership to deliver on the expected ambitions. And then on the last tight, have a proper uh, follow-up and measurement of the challenges, but as well of the great results that we were able to achieve in the challenging time. It's been quite intense time for all of us and times of really accepting and acknowledging the situation we are in, but at the same time, fantastic learning for, for all Telenor customers as well as the employees. And we strongly believe that based on those learnings, we should take a leap and, and think forward because, as we know the saying, we could not afford uh, to basically uh, not uh, maximize the opportunity of the crisis and get maximum out of it. So we have developed certain beliefs based on the digitalization and modernization journey that we've been since 2016, but as well given this time from March till today. And we would like to share those beliefs with you going uh, forward. So the first one is very clear, no matter where we are, if we are in developed or in emerging market, the customers will be served faster than ever before because they will be connected to those digital platforms. And adaptation will go faster than what we think. And one of the reasons is that there will be more opportunities to do that. And we saw the example even in Bangladesh and across the Asia where we were able to make those shifts in the rather fast time. Will the physical interaction disappear? We don't believe that. However, even the physical interactions, we believe we need to make much more faster and effective. That's why we are embarking on the uh, accelerated program to digitalize all our sales and distribution and customer facing in, uh, processes and the tools in order to serve better and faster our customers. 
technology has been uh, uh, been developing and has been uh, improving year over year, decade over decade, for the last more than 165 years in Telenor. So why is this technology different than previous? Because this technology is not only enabling the change in the telco industry, this technology is creating the opportunities for the development of the whole ecosystem and many different industries, both in the private and the public sector. And that's what we see. And that's why we see the radical move when it comes to uh, maximizing the value of this technology and making sure that it's properly used within our own internal value chain, but as well within the ecosystem and applying those learnings to the other industry. So this will impact not only the telco industry, it will impact all the industries across the globe. And we talk about the uh, people and the organization. And the only way going forward is a trust. And full reliability on everything what we do, starting with our teams, our employees, but as well trust and empower customers. And that's what Telenor is building its journey in order to deliver the same. Having said that, uh, we are fully acknowledging and dealing with the challenges along the way. Because we know that this journey is not over and it will last for quite some years ahead. Or, as we say in Telenor, it will never stop. We can always do better, we can always do faster and more efficient today than what we, done, uh, what we did uh, yesterday. So there is a lot of dilemmas that we as well are fully aware and dealing with, like a digital inclusion, the fight for the new talents and skills that are required to run this new operating and business model, and uh, of course, the, uh, transforming the, the technology into the enablers and uh, maximizing the value of every single uh, part of the technology that we are building. But more importantly is we are fully aware that there is no one big enough to act on its own. And that's why the collaboration is the key for us to succeed. Not only within Telenor and across our markets, but with our peers, with the industry and with the other industries and ecosystem. That's the only way to succeed in this new digitalization era. And this is the only way to really foster and focus on the innovation because we strongly believe that innovation is driven by the diversity, different backgrounds, different views, different um, experiences and uh, different uh, knowledge and skills will make sure that if included will create the growth, not only for Telenor, but for the whole industry. And there are a lot of opportunities. So automation is not going to take away our jobs. Automation and artificial intelligence is going to develop different skill set in each of us human beings, which are much more required to run the business, the soft skills, which will enable us to, through the collaboration and through the focused approach, deliver what we are setting for our ambition. And to conclude, um, Telenor is making a focus in four areas. We say we connect you what matters the most and what we believe that that connection will be digital. Again, not that there will not be a physical interaction, but all those interactions, even when we meet, will be through the digitalized means and the channels. And making uh, 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 the services that we can rely and trust will be the key differentiator as well going forward. We are looking for the seamless operation across the boundaries. And of course, technology, be it 5G, be it cloud, and be it the artificial intelligence will enable that seamless operation. But again, it is the people that will basically connect those dots and make that seam seamless uh, experience and, and seamless development going forward. That's why it's extremely important that we talk about the new skills, new expertise, but as well new leadership uh, merits and values that we want to have 
and as we said, this tight loose tight concept in the flexible way work, where we, through the uh, foundation of trust, and enable each of us to perform what we know the best and contribute to the Telenor uh, benefits as well, not only Telenor, as we said, it is going beyond the telco industry and impacting and changing the lives both in the business and the private of many people in the countries where we operate and beyond. But we say safety first. And this is very important. Security in privacy by design from the idea to the realization and operation and making sure that we can provide the full control and full uh, awareness of our customers that we are protecting the interest and data about them. And as we say in Telenor, uh, it's not about the talk, it's about what you do. Uh, so each of us, every employee, and uh, we are transferring the same uh, values uh, to our um, partners. We need to walk the talk uh, while we are always exploring by working together. We need to deliver on our promise, key promises in the respectful way. Thank you very much. Before we wrap up for the day, I wanted to share a couple of comments that have just come in. One on Graham's observation that 5G will drive us to a tipping point that will allow many other technologies to create new jobs. Uh, another comment saying this, great to see how a real example from Telenor shows just how digitalization can create a positive impact by empowering its employees and its customers in very challenging situations. Thank you so much to Nokia CEO Pekka Lundmark and all of our speakers who contributed so much to this event, uh, customers, and of course, for all of you who have been watching throughout this event. Now, don't forget that you can check out all of the sessions on demand. You can get them over at nokia.com slash CSP. You can also get all of the videos from the contributors of this event today. Thank you again for watching and we'll see you soon.